what kind of subject is the Vedic Shudra? Um, while sort of working on this, it, uh, I, it only occurred to me actually relatively lately and embarrassingly so that, oh, oh, here's an evocative line that you can find in the Vedas. The Brahman is the Shudras of the Rajanyas. And I want to unpack that, but closer to the end. Uh, it only occurred to me relatively late in my research process that uh, this was also a question that Ambedkar had asked in a, in a nearly 300 page essay, um, which is to say not that we share necessarily the same methodology and not the same conclusions, but I am one iteration in this kind of wondering um, what, what, what does this term really designate? And how did it come to designate what we see in the Dharma, in the Dharma Sutras and Dharma Shastras? Um, and why is now a good time to ask this question? Uh, well, I'll get to that. Uh, but first of all, what is a Shudra in the Dharma Shastras? I, I'm going to rely here on Olive Bell's translation, but as you can see, it's, it's, there's not a lot of positive stuff to say there. We know that Shudras are some figure who is born into a status. They're prohibited from uh, Vedic study and their rights do not bear fruit. Um, they are not supposed, you're not supposed to, uh, Shudras are not supposed to have sex with Arya women, and it's of the same type of pollution as eating food you're not supposed to, etc. cetera. Um, and again, the punishment for this is quite harsh. Shudras are not allowed to hurl abusive words. Um, and in general, there's sort of the optionality of seizing Shudra property, according to the Dharma Sutras, um, especially if you need to give something to your teacher. Um, and occasionally we also have this indication that the Shudra could be an artisan so long as that falls under the, the umbrella of being a servant. Okay, so according to the Dharma Sutras, Shudras are excluded from ritual activities, restricted in their sexual partnerships, their property is subject to seizure, um, they're, they're ultimately servants, they're born in this position and polluted and contemptible. These texts, I strongly doubt, uh, really describe someone's, uh, everyone's lived experience, but it, you know, it's an idealization for, of, by Dharma Sutra creators of what their world should look like, okay? Uh, why should that not be what it also, what the designate is in the Vedas. Well, there's a couple good reasons why I think it's time to reconsider a lot of what we think about a lot of these terms of art in the Vedas. Um, recently, a edited volume called Durhasta has come out on the prehistory of the householder. And there's a common thesis in all the contributions, which is to say that the figure of the Durhasta is really a novel element of the Vedic religious, or sorry, of the post-Vedic religious landscape. There's a big break from earlier Vedic ideas. And it seems to be in, an, in a reinvention of a way of being a kind, someone who's equally religious or maybe even supremely religious, more so than the renouncers. That is, it is a, a new idea that there's a way of not being a renouncer that's even better. And it's discontinuous with the Vedic landscape because it's reactionary. Um, in, oh, I, yeah, no, that's correct. In uh, Nathan McGovern's uh, The Snake and the Mongoose, he goes so far as to say that even the title of Brahmana has been arrogated by these Gurhastav supremacists, these reactionaries who are trying to say, actually, the real true Brahmana is the Gurhasta, essentially, who's been born into this position. And this is radically out of sync with earlier depictions of the figure of the Brahmana as someone who's completed a Brahmacharya. That is, they've gone through a protracted period and perhaps a permanent period of celibacy. And, um, and perhaps also vegetarianism and certain different modes of life. Now, Brahmana for the Dharma Sutras is a, a sexually transmitted status, right? You have to inherit it through a previous act of sex as opposed to the Brahmana who is a product of Brahmacharya by, by rejecting that. So if both sort of what we think of as the most stable elements of Dharma Sutra Varna and Dharma Sutra Ashrama are quite novel, then what exactly are they irrigating to themselves? What are the earlier designates? Are we able to determine these or, has it, or is it simply an unknown? And everything that we thought we knew about these terms has just been an, an anachronistic assumption or an argument from silence. 
Um, so I have to briefly say, what are the Vedas? Of course, the Vedas exist today. The Vedas existed in the classical period. The Vedas existed in the Dharma Sutra period. But for the sake of brevity, uh, and the, sake, the fact that I only have 40 minutes to, to give you this yarn, uh, I'm only going to look at the earliest Vedic texts. I have a lot of data on Brahmanas of the middle Vedic period. So talking about the Vedas does not necessarily imply uh, talking about the Vedic period, but I'm going to go with a kind of, um, I'm going to look at these strata of composition and try and infer what I think the text expected of their audiences, their earliest reception, their earliest audiences. So I am going to refer to the Vedic period. Um, and so by the Vedas, I mean, not just the tradition of recitation of a body of sacred revelatory literature, but materials that were created in their time in order to service the needs of, uh, of a society that, had, that used them for ceremonial purposes, uh, for a variety of ceremonial purposes. Um, usually ceremonial purposes that, that, uh, they were, that resolved some kind of relationship between different clans, clan as the political designation, uh, and ultimately in their, in their time during the Vedic period, we believe that the Vedas were used primarily to create uh, a clan, create and sustain a clan coalition. So they had a, a very immediate political for, uh, function. And from that political function, I want to infer things about the text. And while I'm not necessarily going to say this based on this text, this is what I can say about Vedic society, I actually want to walk away from that. But I do think those inferences allow me to say, this is what I think Vedas are trying to do in, the con in their earliest context. OK, uh, so over time, I hope to continue this research all the way up into the present, or up to the present, up into the present of the Dharma Sutras and have a nuanced theory of how did whatever we're going to look at become this system of subjugation, exploitation, and exclusion that is the Shudra of the, of the Dharma Sutras. How did it get to be that way? Um, is there a history that we can excavate? Uh, well, we have to start with what we think it's doing in its earliest materials. Um, so first, one valid question is, is Varna even important, is pr of particular importance in the Vedas? Um, some would say yes. So in classifying the universe, uh, Smith says, hey, listen, Varna is so important. It's this Dumezilian triadic concept that uh, is really threefold and not fourfold. And it's so important that it becomes the model for all Vedic triadic reasoning. Um, but I'm very skeptical of that point. For, for this reason, Varna is not triadic in the Rig Veda, our oldest source. Um, if anything, it's dual because they occasionally talk about the Arya Varna and the Dasa Varna. And then all of a sudden, when it shows up in the next layer of materials, the, the mantras and prose of the early Black Yajurvedic Samhitas, um, it's, it's quadripartite. So we go from two to four, and there never really seems to be a textually uh, cited moment where Varna is triadic, where it would be possible for it to suddenly become so important that it becomes the model for all triplicate forms of reasoning and then suddenly become uh, fourfold. I think this is like a Duke of York derivation, right? The soldiers go up the hill, they take one shot, and then they go back down the hill, and it's like they never took the shot. That's maybe not the best description of a Duke of York derivation. But anyway, so I agree more with uh, Stephen Lindquist's uh, summary, which is that when Varna shows up, usually it's to talk about the Brahmana. And when, um, and when you get another Varna, it's usually the relationship between Brahmana and Kshatriya. And everything else kind of takes a back seat. So I think there's a very specific sort of, uh, there's a specific locus for this kind of discussion. And it's not to be informative. It's not to be broadly informative about social systems. <laughs> Okay, so let me share with you a little bit my method. Um, in classifying the universe, um, uh, Smith translates this as there are three persons other than the Rajanya, and he, uh, aka, well, he translates, there are three persons other than the Kshatriya, he just subs Rajanya for Kshatriya, um, and he, the, the Kshatriya, subjugates or makes subordinate the Brahmana, Vaishya, and Shudra. So there's a couple interesting things about this already. One, I would say, notice that the Shudra isn't singled out for subordination. The other thing is there's no real good reason to assume that 
the ablative singular Rajanyat is going to be resumed as the unmarked subject of Karoti. Uh, usually the unmarked subject in a given Samhita is first by default, the acting priest. That is, this would be the Advaryu. And when it's clearly not the Advaryu, it must be the Yajamana. Those are your first two options before you go looking for a third subject. And in this case, I think it's the Yajamana. But in my performative readings of these texts, Samhitas are not informative out of context. They have a particular time and place when they were uttered aloud, they were performed, and they were inactive. That is their performative, uh, their performative speech acts um, that don't just relate information, but they transform what's going on at the social occasion of performance. So we should not read this as a broad description of society in which, oh yeah, outside, off the ritual ground, the, uh, the, uh, the Yajamana has made the, the Brahmana, Vaishya, and Shudra his follower. We should rather see this as something that's occurring at a specific point in time where this uh, Anukatva, if you will, is being ritually enacted. And there's no assumption. And I, don't, I think it's very wrong to assume universality or ubiquity in these kinds of performative uh, utterances. They're really context specific. So that's what I want to emphasize going forward, that every time we look at a text, it's got a time and a place, and we don't necessarily know the time and the place, but it knows. Um, okay, so I wanna to return to this ceremonial function of the Vedas uh, in their own time, especially in the early Vedic period, because something very special is happening between the content in the suktas, in the poems of the Rig Veda, and in the structure of the Rig Veda, when it's become an anthology of suktas, uh, there's, there is content in that form. And also when these other Vedas show up, that is, when did we go from this, we might call it Indraist religious movement represented by the poems of the Rig Veda to a triple Vedic system? What's going on? What motivated the tra the, that transformation, that uh, change? Um, and what's the use of these texts and what do these ceremonies do? <laughs> well, one thing is that in the suktas of the Rig Veda, What's represented is a very seasonal mode of subsistence, patronage and hospitality, and leadership that is, is adaptive to that scenario. So uh, in the summer, everyone spreads out, they go into the highlands, there's lots of nice pasturage, uh, and it's warmer. In the winter, uh, those, the, the summer, uh, you know, those streams that are made of melted snow have dried up or frozen, people retreat down to the lower, warmer, uh, lowlands and gather around larger uh, rivers and streams and live communally. So there's this constant uh, fission fusion model that Pref uh, Ted Preferis in his uh, 2007 book uh, talks about a great deal. Um, so that seems to be the system of, um, of annual subsistence change. And a lot of what we think we see in the Rig Vedic suktas are part of that system. That is, they adapt to those lifestyle changes with a calendar of ritual events. Um, in the summertime, there seems to have been lots of uh, raids and general distance between the clans. In the wintertime, those clans uh, reassemble and then they kind of have to deal with what happened during the summer. Uh, I think an appropriate modern colloquialism is they have to quash the beef. Um, so this is a verse from the perspective of Indra. And, you know, Indra, of course, as a poet, impersonating Indra, it's very important that Indra lets you know that uh, not being generous and being stingy, that's real bad. So you always want to be very generous, the hospitality system. But he's saying if you're stingy, even during Kshema, the opposite of summer, which is yoga, the winter is Kshema, even during Kshema, the resting season, uh, he would lay waste to you. Well, to the one on the mountain, having grabbed his foot. Now, usually the guy on the mountain is Vritra, the cosmic snake. But look, he has a foot here. So I think we're being cued that this is not just the cosmic snake. This is some potential hypothetical stingy patron. And we'll see that uh, a common metaphor for political power in this period and in the early period that follows uh, is being at rest or reclining on a mountain. Um, so clan coalitions get legitimated through ritual, and there's not a strong, a lot of evidence that these coalitions are permanent. In fact, they probably fluctuated seasonally. Here's a nice line from the Shaunakya uh, Samhita of the Atarva Veda. Let the clans choose you for ruling them. Let these five divine directions choose you, be at rest on top at the realm zenith from there, being mighty divvy out the goods to us. So often Vedic society conceptualizes itself as fivefold, the panchajana, 
And that has been argued as being, um, you know, there's a sort of socio-political center, the guy the clans all elect to be the Rajan, and the other five folks rest and sort of uh, at the margins of that, that is north, south, east, west. And that's the five folk model. Um, again, we see that the ruler, it gets to re rest at the realm's zenith. But something seems to change in the early mantra period. Once we enter a period where we have a triple Vedic system, and I call this the triple Vedic system uh, because it requires efficiency, it requires actors from three Vedic traditions, each of which is specialized in a distinct corpus and a, a type of speech act and a type of ritual labor. Um, the office of Rajan does not seem seasonal at all. It actually seems to last the whole year. So here we have the Rajan. He gets to say through the power of Vach, I am consecrated. I am become the ruler. And then he gets his messengers to go out and repeat what he says. That is, he's the ruler because how else are you going to spread the news except through this sort of verbal echoing? Lots of models of political power, especially in the early mantra period, have to do with spatial pervasion and auditory stuff being heard. Um, probably why the, the cosmic Purusha's ear becomes the directions. Uh, I might have to circle back to this. So Shudra, the word shows up one time in the Rig Veda. Um, and you'll notice it doesn't really say a whole lot. First of all, nowhere in the Purusha Sukta, which is the text it shows up in, does it actually mention the word Varna? It gives us some sort of hierarchy of the in which Brahmana, uh, Rajanya, Vaishya, and Shudra, we could say, well, sure, that's an implicit hierarchy modeled after the body. Uh, and generally things that are up or good and down are worse. So there, I'm, not just, I'm not trying to argue this isn't taxonomic on some level, um, but all the other things that we saw in the Dharma Sutras are simply absent. There's no contempt. There's no uh, mark of specific ritual exclusion. There's no mark, uh, there's no reference to birth. There's no reference to sexual relations. The word Varna doesn't even show up here. And it's likely, I think that these four types of people have not yet been associated with the word Varna and that that's partially the work of the later period or the, that generation or one generation later, I don't know. But you know, the point is there's not even a, a, a evidence of association. Um, in, their, in their translation, uh, Jameson and Brereton kind of recapitulate the traditional Dharma Sutra story there. They call the Shudras servants. Uh, they describe these Varna class, they invoke Varna and they describe the classes in their Dharma Sutra uh, iterations, um, but none of it is really in the text. So I, I don't wanna take a very long aside on the um, Purusha Sukta, but it's a very interesting text because it has so many recensions with different orders and the different orders are not accidental. If we look at the different versions, they actually seem to have intelligently and creatively and poetically restructured verses to create concatenated ring compositions, which I think must have highlighted, uh, emphasized certain elements by giving them central focus. And I don't want to get into that now because that's a whole thing. Um, but there's kind of an island of stability in these texts that I've been calling the Song of Viraj. And it seems to me maybe the, the if there is a prehistory to the Purusha Sukta, that it might have been about this relationship between the Purusha and Viraj. And I'm going to uh, elaborate on that relationship a little bit, but that means that everything else is kind of a secondary articulation of this core story of the relationship between Purusha and Viraj, uh, and that's worth thinking about. That is already, the Purusha Sukta is late in the Rig Veda. It's in Mandala 10, it's in the youngest material. To me, it strongly suggests that out of this, perhaps this core island of stability, that the Purusha Sukta was articulated possibly already in the earliest period of the, the mantra period, that is when the, after the uh, division or after the creation of a triple Vedic system of ceremony, uh, the Purusha Sukta may well be a product of that. And there's some evidence that it functions as a kind of charter myth. Um, first of all, it clearly explicates that there's Urcha, that there's verses, that there's Yajus and that there's Samans, melodies, um, and that Yajus are dedicatory ritual statements. Uh, and they have their origin in this Purusha. This is very different than older Rig Vedic cosmogonies, which seem to be tied to the calendar year, and they involve Indra doing something cool, like when he opens up Vala Cave and releases Dawn, New Year's, or when he beats Vritra and release all, releases all the water for mankind. This is generally thought to be a kind of midsummer, melting snow, rivers and spate moment. Um, so, so when we go back 
to this without any assumptions, because I would love to talk more about the Purusha Sukta, but I think I have to put a pen in it right now. If we go back to this particular verse and we sort of allow ourselves to say, well, maybe all those retrojections, we shouldn't do that. This isn't a four person model and it's not associated with Varna. It's a five person model because all of these are related to the Purusha. Why is that important? The Purusha is probably the double of the patron of the sacrifice, the Yajamana, in sort of an earlier iteration. Why? Well, in the later iteration of the Purusha, in Brahmanical texts, Prajapati is basically the sort of charter myth or model for the Yajamana. And I think it makes good sense that the Purusha is both a double for the patron of the sacrifice, the would-be king, but also the body politic that the, the, the tribal coalition that these rituals are intending to bring into being. And if so, then these different types of people are in relation to the body politic. They're in relation to the king who acts as a host and they act as guests. And this five-person model is completely consistent with other five-person models of society in the Vedas, the Panchajana we talked about. I would go so far as to argue the horse sacrifice, which has a horse, the upper limit of masculinity, who is uh, surrounded with four women, um, that is also sort of totalizes as a five person model with the king and the, the, the clans that are subordinate to him. Um, so this kind of model is, is not actually suddenly novel and therefore we can't assume that there's a novel system already here. I think that remains to be seen. So once we've sort of distanced ourselves from thinking that this already enshrines some kind of system, we can start to knock down, I think, other assumptions or other arguments the Dharma Sutras make. Uh, because you won't find really any evidence for them in early Vedic material. Um, is the Shudra an ethnic designation? This is purely an assumption, and you will find it if you if you type in Shudra in the online Monia Monia Williams Dictionary. It has a lot of unwarranted assumptions, and it seems to be an extension that, of the idea that Das and Arya are ethnic designations. I don't think they are. That's not to say that Vedic society just didn't know anything about racism. <laughs> no, hardly. I just as they didn't, just as it would be silly to say, just because I don't think X is this type of, uh, this type of oppressed class, that there's no oppression. What I simply mean to say is that the texts don't seem to give us these terms of art as those terms of art. These terms of art, Das and Arya, I do not think are ethnic designations. I don't think that's supported by the material, uh, unless you read it in sort of a documentary way that ignores most of what's going on poetically. Uh, and I sort of hesitated to even bring this up in this talk because it would take up a lot of time to do justly. So I'm going to do it unjustly. But I think they're political designations. A Vish is a clan in the coalition. Ari, the other, means another Vishpati or another clan. This is the big anxiety of the Rig Veda. They want some, they want sort of uh, Samraj or Samda. They want a clan coalition, but they're also anxious that they'll be in a coalition subordinate to another clan and lose Svadha lose their autonomy. Um, and this is something I think the Purusha Sukta resolves nicely by this relationship between the Purusha and Viraj, instead of Svaraj or Samraj, this sort of both types. Let's pretend there is no tension between these sort of, um, yeah. So Arya is not an ethnic designation. It's a pretty derivative to Ari, the other clan, and therefore describes elites and rituals that are used in inter-clan mediation things like detente, things like kingship, things like marriage, things like funerals. These all involve multiple clans and they operate at a level um, that we can think of as, uh, at a political level that we might think of as the inter-clan level, which means that 99% of religious life in the Vedic period is probably unknown to us because it would be internal to a clan. And this is what was used for inter-clan ceremony. So of course, that means that most things are going to be arguments from, from um, well, most things we won't know about that are going on in the Rig Vedic period. Um, okay. So Dasa is, an, is sort of the enemy of the Arya, but if Arya is a political designation and marks interiority to a certain political coalition, then Dasa is exteriority to that. I see it as kind of two factions or two political parties. There's not a lot of evidence anywhere that we should read these as racial designations. Let me give you an example of why I think that's a mistake. Um, Oh, here's a little, here's a talk about short vowel Ari. I can get back to that if there are questions. Um, but here is something that's used to invoke that Dasa are, uh, are a different race that have dark skin, even though this 
line, and this poem doesn't mention the Dasa, they say those who like kind, busy, energetic, bubbling, strode forward, striking away the black hide. Well, this ignores the fact that often cows are metaphors for the rays of dawn, and the black hide is a metaphor for the night sky. Um, so if we read these texts unpoetically, we can come to these conclusions. I don't think we should. Is the Shudra a professional? Now, um, Chris Minkowski has written uh, an article, I think still stands, on the Retikata, uh, Retikara's uh, eligibility to sacrifice. Um, but I think it, it's overstating it to say that there is um, a marked question as to whether Shudras are eligible for sacrifice based off this. Because what's interesting is even though early texts have made this allowance for the Retikara to be eligible to participate in sacrifice, it's not until much later, until our Dharma Sutras, that we're told that, there's, that the Retikara is in fact um, uh, linked to the Shudra. So the Retikara shows up, and if only if we retroject that Dharma Sutra relationship, will we see this as telling us anything about the Shudra. In fact, Shudra and Retikara nary the twain shall meet in our earliest Vedic texts. So once again, we just don't know. Are they excluded from the sacrifice? This is an interesting passage where we see Shudra and Arya recapitulating the tug of war of perhaps Dasa and, uh, and Arya, and also, of course, the, the um, the cosmogonic, the macrocosmic level of that, the devas and asuras tugging of war over something, and they're tugging of war over the sun, because the sun, um, and often the sun, Indra, and Vara's body is a metaphor, uh, following Preferis 2007, for the body politic, for the clan coalition. So the devas here win the Aryavarna, and therefore also the Arya will win the Aryavarna. But this isn't a, a myth about Aryas and Shudras. This is a this is a ritual utterance. It's in the Katasamita. So there was some kind of fictive tug of war, and we're told specifically that you need to use a real hide. It'll be circular and white, which is the color of the thing of Aditi, aka the sun. Um, so I don't generally think of the sun as white, but you know it's. It's a link to the sun, and they're going to tug of war over the sun. The sun winning the sun is an old Rig Vedic theme of uh, basically getting to be on top in a clan coalition. And if the Shudra had won, maybe he would be the Arya. But that's speculation. The point is here that the Shudra definitely is not excluded from the ritual here. He has a ritual role to play. Uh, he's got to pull on that hide. So what follows here is this nice Ambedkar quote, where Ambedkar asks, and I think a question unanswered, if the Shudras are all that they're purported to be by the Dharma Sutras, why do we have these texts that seem to think Shudras are really important and great? Uh, just three identical versions of the same thing. Uh, the Katasamita tells us you want to shine, that is, be visible. So light visibility equals fame and be known. Among the Brahmanas, the Rajans, and, um, among the Vishya, not the Vaishya, so shows that the system really hasn't been fully articulated into key technical terms yet, the Vishya here instead of Vaishya, and the Shudras. The same idea in this other Black Yajurvedic text, the Maitrayani Samhita, um, and again, the same idea in the Paipalata recension of the Atarva Veda. You, this, is, this is not just idle wishing, of course, this is inactive. The, this is some sort of public declaration, make me famous amongst these people who are presumably gathered here at this social occasion. And I think this not only indicates that being famous, public, visible amongst these four types of groups uh, or four people, we don't know their groups. Um, well, here it's in the plural, but sometimes it's not. Usually it's not. Um, actually suggests their, their, uh, their presence. It's also not really clear in any point that these are terms of self-reference, identities, or, you know, uh, that whenever a designation is being applied, it's being applied by some, by a hierophant with the power to make these kinds of designations. And occasionally at the margins of these texts, we see that there's a good chance they don't really, they might not even exist off the ritual ground. We can see here from uh, this um, Atarva Vedic hymn where the Atarva Vedan says he can, is essentially saying, I can use this special plant uh, to get special vision, to see the invisible, and I can see which one is the Shudra and which one is the Arya, right? That means it's not visibly obvious if you need a special plant and you need a special speech act to do it. He's making a determination through his powers, which presumably are exclusively his, and not something that people would just know or would be a term of self-reference. Um, 
there's not a lot of evidence that the shudra was despised in any way. There's actually one line that I want to deal with and something that I want to expand on in my work is the, the feminine shudra, uh, because this does seem quite negative. Fever, go from Mujavant to the Balhikas or further, seek a promiscuous shudra and shake her, O fever. This is the most negative statement you get about a shudra in the entire early corpus. Uh, Mujavant, the mountain, uh, is probably here from the poet's patron. That is the, you know, we already saw poets recline on the mountain as a metaphor for political, sorry, not poets. Uh, the Lord of the Alliance reclines on a mountain. It's a metaphor for his political power. And uh, presumably everyone else would be lower on that mountain. Um, this is a position of strength and therefore being off the mountain, being a woman, being labeled as sexually illicit, these are all vulnerabilities. So I'm not sure if this really says, tells us anything at all about the status of being Shudra, in, except that it's the opposite of, it's the vulnerable opposite of all these things that the poet's patron is, that is male um, and politically powerful and, and, and likely uh, married if he's patronizing uh, Shrapta ritual. Um, Okay, no evidence that Shudra is restricted from sexual partnerships with Arya women. Some know this first line from the Maitrayani Samhita, but fewer know the second one from the Vajrasanei Samhita uh, Madhyandana recension, which is just its gender flip. Um, but in essence, these are said during the horse sacrifice ritual, the four women that surround the horse, they get to exchange sort of uh, sexually explicit riddles, brahmodias with their priestly partners. And um, these are the ones uh, uh, performed by the Paligali, who's the lowest rank of the four women. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems to me, you know, we, it, it, I don't want to make, I don't want to make the firm foundation of any argument a riddle, because that's, a, they're purposefully obscure. And I think they function as kind of, you know, uh, little puzzles, you solve them and prove your interiority. Um, but the way this seems to me is that we have a distinction between wild and domestic, and we have, um, and that the shudra uh, might, that the shudra, when they actually enjoy the things that the Arya enjoys, suddenly stops thinking too much about struggling and profit. And that kind of sounds to me like um, a negative comment, but a negative comment that depicts them as hardworking and ladder climbing. And suddenly when they have uh, a, good, a good thing with this significant other of higher rank on this taxonomy, uh, suddenly they stop thinking so hard about ladder climbing. What does that imply? I could speculate, but I wanna do, I wanna speculate later basically. But what you can see is that if it's the subject of a riddle, then it's certainly not, uh, it doesn't really tell us about real sexual relationships, but it's not, uh, it's not um, unthinkable. I guess is what I'd say. In fact, maybe it's considered funny. Uh, I don't want to. I, I bring in this Rig Vedic line from one of my favorite Rig Vedic hymns because in this, at this point, the Maruts, they want to, they show up at Indra's sacrifice. They want to take all the good stuff from the sacrifice. And they say, look how strong we are. We are so many of us. And the Maruts are often, you know, the mimetic doubles of the young men of the clans. They're beautiful. They're swift. They, they're warriors. And they say, look, we're yoked with our closest ones, typically understood to be horses. And our bodies are beautified by self-commanded ones, typically understood to be horses again. Um, and we, and in addition to that, we hitch up antelopes. So check out our svadhas, check out our, our political autonomy, our self-determination, oh, Indra. And Indra's like, I don't care. I don't care because you all some, you samad, uh, uh, samad that dad, you all some plus dad, you all put me together when, it was me who alone, and one of the themes of this poem is the singularity of Indra, who slew Virtra. And, and I didn't just like, I wasn't just given that position, I'm the best. And so the, the Maruts are, are cowed by this. Um, but what's interesting is their claims is, look, we've got our closest guys, our closest horses who have self-command, and our antelopes. Um, now look at our self-determination. Now I see this in this poem in a way as a kind of story about strife in clan coalitions and how Indra is the perfect, is, would be the perfect suzerain of such a coalition and how the Maruts ultimately uh, decide, yeah, he's actually the best. Let's bend the knee and become, go from being his adversaries to his entourage. One of the things the Maruts praise about themselves is, um, oh gosh, I'm almost out of time. Um, one of the things the Maruts praise about themselves in this case is that they have, they have their guys and also these wild antelopes who are also peripheral. 
So I think there's some kind of recapitulation of this wild domestic peripheral relationship that might be worth thinking about. Um, evidence that shudras are categorically impoverished or incapable of patronizing priests, you won't find it. Shudras can patronize priests. And here's a wish in the second line that shudras should be paying us a dakshina, that is a, a priestly ritual fee for us to do rituals for them. Um, not really any evidence that they do things differently than raj rajanyas. Um, when rajanyas and shudras show up to me, the Atarva Vedan pierced with poison arrows, they go back without poison. So evidently they're both warriors. Here we have this nice, um, this nice verse where by means of the Brahman and Rajanya and the clansfolk, the Vishya again, and the Shudras and the assembly will overwhelm all attackers. So we're all on the same team here. And in general, so to depart and go to, uh, go to Iceland for a, reason, uh, for a moment, uh, at the beginning of the poetic Edda, the, Vol the Volva, the, the seeress who, who makes this revelation says, I bid all families to listen, the greater and lesser sons of Heimdall. You wouldn't say the lesser sons of Heimdall are necessarily servants or despised. You wouldn't say that they're sexually restricted from the greater sons of Heimdall. This is simply a merism. And that at, at the core is what Shudra and Arya do in the early materials. They're two halves that add up to a whole. It's a compositional metaphor. Instead of saying everybody does something, you say Shudra and Arya did something. And I can show you tons and tons of examples where there's nothing else going on except a merism for the totality of the of the coalition. I'll just give you a few seconds on each of these, but they're all basically identical. Um, Shudra and Arya show up in a non-negative way to simply represent the totality of society. Indra cast away fears, fear from our Shudra and our Arya, and so on and so forth. This is the thing I invoked at the beginning, but here Brahman is, we don't have the accent on this line, but it's very likely actually the, the speech act, the poetic composition. The poem is the Rajanya's Shudra, the poem is the Vish supporters, the poem is their good seat, presumably at the sacrifice. And by means of the poem, the Sabha supporters will be there. I think this is a promise by the Pipe Aladdin that says, listen, I have the, the Brahman speech and you Rajanya know that you need Shudras, you need Vaishas, you need Brahmanas. And the poem is equivalent to all these things. And in fact, in fact, through the poem, you'll even get Sabha supporters, which I think are other Rajanyas, because I think a Rajanya is a potential Rajan, someone who could potentially be elected such a, such a leader. Um, so are there limitations? There are in fact two. Um, in the early materials, the Shudra should not milk an Agnihotra. The Agnihotra was that thing that um, when the, the king, the Vedic king in the Rajasuya becomes king, he says, I am become king. He has to do an Agnihotra for a year, suggesting a year for continuity, suggesting a year uh, in office. Um, and the Shudra should not milk the Agnihotra but I, because he comes from non-being and it's not clear what that means. But in this other passage in the Taittiriya Samhita, we're told that Shudras are like horses. That is, they have to be led somewhere. And I could talk at great length why I think this is. And there's a whole um, imagery of, of the sacrifice as a chariot um, that this is intertwined in. But in essence, it means that a, shud a horse and therefore also Shudra have to be led to something. So they are ritual participants, but they're not autonomous ritual participants. They need to be conducted. So quick summary here. Shudra does not seem to ever be referred to as inherited, immutable, professional, or ethnic designation. Uh, ritually inferior, but not materially inferior. Seems to form a part of a uh, formulaic merism in which Arya seems to indicate Shudra and Arya uh, form the totality of society. And Shudra seem important. Uh, it, having their support and being famous among them seems important. Um, so I think there is a ritual degradation going on here and I don't wanna to speak too broadly about society but here's basically my working hypothesis. I think that when that the, the category is either invented, reinvented or reapplied by the nascent triple Vedic tradition which works it into its recension of the Purusha Sukta, all the recensions now of the Purusha Sukta that survive, this triple Vedic system developed for a more permanent alliance that was not seasonal, but kind of like a proto-polity. And probably the project of the triple Vedas was the was the project of this Kuru, what we could today call the Kuru polity. It's not named actually in the earliest text. Um, and that this was used for the regulate the social regulation and ceremonial purposes of this alliance. Well, it's a pretty good alliance. It's stable, it's very profitable. And if you were on the mar, if you formerly were a Rig Vedic Indraist or not, doesn't actually say exactly what you did before, but maybe you could get your foot in the door and you could become a Shudra. That is, you're a newcomer. You come from non-being. You're like a horse. You have to be led, but you might be some sort of initiate. And I think that Shudra 
in the earliest texts, we can we can't really any of these things from the Dharma sutras can, are completely from silence. They might have existed, but there's no evidence they do. And instead, it seems like what we have is a ritually degraded initiate, some kind of pledge, probationary or petitionary member. Um, and I think that religion, it was less likely a motivation than political expediency. This was a good alliance to be a part of. Um, and let's see, do I have anything else I really want to say here? So far, that's where I think the earliest texts tell us. I, I could speak in Q&A about Middle Vedic texts, which actually sort of support this conclusion, uh, which I've been looking at. Um, and I could potentially proffer an even more tentative hypothesis of what's what happens at the end of the Vedic period that would make what the Dharma Sutras are doing even possible. But of course, that's extremely, extremely tentative. And it, this is still very much a working hypothesis. But as you can see, I went through basically every almost every attestation of Shudra in the material. And what if you're looking for Dharma Sutra stuff, you're not going to find it. 